when you dialogue with Cornell West, you've got to come prepared. You can't just walk out on stage, uh, you know, do that kind of thing. So. <clears throat> I'd like to thank Chris Tires and the Concilio Latino, the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies, and all the people who've gotten behind this event this afternoon. I confess I feel as though I'm following Cornell West here today. I was at the University of Colorado in Boulder for a number of years, and Cornell, Tony Morrison, Arcadio Diaz Quinones, and others recruited me to come to Princeton. I had lunch with Cornell in Princeton. I remember it so well. He said to me, come on over here, brother. Come on over here to Princeton so you and I can decipher signs and amazing movements the signs and wonders in these religious traditions and social movements of transformation. He even said, we'll make signs and wonders together. <clears throat> he said, put this distance behind us and come on over here. So I left the spacious Rockies and friends and familiar surroundings and the Broncos. <laughs> and I came to Princeton and Cornell left. but I miss him terribly. And so I'm so grateful to be back here sharing this space with you and also to work with Doris Summer. I've come here today to respond to this provocative question and the words in the title, Whose Eyes on What Prize? A black-brown discussion of shades of invisibility. My first response is to tell you of a reaction I had recently when I was going by one of those, what I call Amistad windows. You know what I'm talking about, those windows that have all those promotion books about the movie and books about promoting other books about the movie. Books about the movie, books about books about the movie, books about the lawsuits about the books about the movie. And as I was going by this window and looking at all this, I noticed an unusual weariness in me, an anger, in fact, in my response that surprised me. I was tired of something in this story about the slave ship. I did not feel amistad, friendship, toward this window. And I tried to examine myself and say, why did I feel this weary anger? First, I thought, well, is it my discomfort because of the market forces pushing this story upon me, this story of white on black atrocities, these black-white relations and the events in the story itself that eventually freed these African peoples? Was it the market as a manipulator that was tiring me out? Uh, but I had to ask a harder question, a second question of myself. Did I detect some latent racism in me? In spite of the fact that I ran with my father, the first Mexican-American to be a head basketball coach at a major university in this country, while he and African-American athletes broke through, no, demolished the color line in Washington, D.C., when Georgetown and GW and the University of Maryland only put white people in their public performances of athletics, when as a kid I had been at Spingarn High School and Dunbar High School and Kelly Miller Playground and knew what these names meant in those communities. In spite of that, did I carry some latent racism in me? I had to check this. Latinos need to check this all the time. Do we carry some latent kinds of racism in us to this discourse? Could be. Who else? I mean, who in the United States where we have been saturated with the history of racial nullifications could not be infected with this virus. But I did not think that that was the source of my discomfort at this window. No, what was wearing me out and causing me some rising anger was the interpretive power of the black-white dichotomy, here symbolized in a Spanish language word, amistad, meaning friendship, and the potential exclusivity of this black-white dichotomy to multi-narratives of race and class and liberation. And I was tired of seeing films and reading books where they'd never acknowledge the history or the social racial complexity and dynamism of black, red, Latin American, brown relationships. This is what was wearing me out and bringing me some heat. I was tired of seeing all of this, which erased the complexity and the power and the mutilations and the creativities of Latin American and Latinos, even though they've often been right in the center of these stories or on the periphery of these stories or mixed in with these stories. The words of Guillermo Gomez Peña came to me. 
when he was talking about the situation of being a Chicano in this strange nation. He has a little poem called Alien Nation. Alien Nation. Alien Native. Alien Hatred. Alien Out There. I Alguien Out There. Aliens the Movie. Aliens the Album. Cowboys and Aliens. Bikers versus Aliens. The Wet Back from Mars. The Mexican Transformer and his Radioactive Torta. <laughs> the Conquest of Tenochtitlan by Spielberg. The Reconquest of Aslan by Monty Python. I am, therefore I cross, cross over dreams. I begin to think of the research of my colleague Albert Rabato, African-American brother at Princeton who when working on his remarkable encyclopedia on the history of African-American religion shows that there's a narrowness in the black-white polarity once you put it in the context of the wider Americas. The history of slavery in America, in the U.S., this polarity works so well. A hegemonic, hegemonic model with inaccuracies in some places like New Orleans, Charleston, and the Caribbean. But this hegemony of the black-white model breaks down with the hybridities of the Caribbean and in Mexico. And when those are acknowledged, acknowledged Suddenly, you've got a dialogue. Also, I was concerned for the crisis of this democracy. Uh, what you'll hear today, and what you hear a lot from Latinos now, is that we got the demographics. We will overwhelm. Well, demographics are very important in here, but demographics have got to be turned into democracy, some new conceptions of democracy. It's not just a matter of we got more people coming in from Latin America. What are they going to bring? What are they going to meet? What are we going to do within the fact in the lifetime of any 20-year-old today at Harvard, no one ethnic group, including whites of European descent, will comprise a majority of the national population? In what follows, I want to do three things for you. First of all, I want to play a piece of music for you from a friend of mine who's got a group called Dr. Loco and the Rocking Jalapeno Band <laughs> to set up the spirit of the kind of thing I want to play, want to do today. Secondly, I want to do a meditation for you on some ideas I have about what I'm going to call today the Brown Millennium and the ecumenopolis of the Brown Millennium. And thirdly, I want to play a little game of numbers. Since we're at the end of the century of the problem of the color line and the end of the millennium of whatever, I want to also talk about the years 1848 and 1898, very important years in the history of this country and the history of these people, which Doris already mentioned. But first of all, I'd like to play the music from Dr. Loco and the Rocking Jalapenos. And while they're getting that ready, I just want to say something about the words. I had a chance to meet last night with some of the students here, and they said something to me very important. They said, on this campus, it's actually kind of hard for us to even say the words Latino and Latin American. We go into classes and professors say, Latino, Latino, Latino. It reminded me, when I was an undergraduate, I took a course in dramatic art, and we had to do recitals in places like this, in a big room like this, only you'd only have 15 people in the audience. And that's hard to keep those people, you know, you keep your concentration going. I was taking a course in dramatic art with a woman named Esther Smith, the sister of Lillian Smith. Lillian Smith, who wrote that remarkable novel, Strange Fruit, about an interracial love affair in the South. Lillian Smith, who wrote Killers of the Dream. Lillian Smith, who wrote Our Faces, Our Words. Well, her sister was my teacher. And for my first recital in college, she said, you got to do this piece by Norman Cousins. And it's on the death of Albert Schweitzer. So I did my recital about Albert Schweitzer. And I came off the stage, and she was there waiting for me. And she said something to me I never forgot. She said to me, she looked up at me, and she said, honey, she called everybody honey. She said, honey, you were wonderful. But when you say the words Africa and Europe, I want to be able to see the continent appear before me. It's not Africa and Europe. Well, you've got to get used to saying Latino and Latin America because these are important places, and Boricua and Puerto Rico, these are just as important as Africa and Europe. And as an example of that, let me have you play, have you hear uh, this cut from Dr. Loco and the Rocking Jalapeno Band 
This is their album called Movimiento Music. It's number 10. It's called Nosotros Venceremos. We Shall Overcome. So could you play that for me? <laughs> 